and we're live. Good morning. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to this latest uh, Practico Cost Chat Between Friends. Uh, of the friends today are, as usual, Andy Ellis, Managing Director of Practico, and me, Jeremy Morgan, Retired Cost Silk. And our guest today, who we're delighted to welcome, is Andrew Post Casey of Hailsham Chambers, who's been a guest many times before on these chats, and I'm sure is well known to all of you. Um, brief housekeeping point before we go any further, you don't need to make extensive notes of uh, this uh, call because we will be providing uh, summary form notes to those who are on the mailing list and also the, um, the whole podcast will be available in the usual places. Um, so moving to a quick uh, outline of what we're going to discuss, we're going to look at possible bombshell in relation to litigation funding in a case which is going on in the Supreme Court at the moment. We're going to have a very quick look at some comments made uh, in the course of the home phone hacking litigation about um, hourly rates. Um, a, a quick reminder of um, the extension of fixed costs, which is um, something we all need to bear in mind. Um, a, a quick look at a, a decision of a cost judge on the challenging by a beneficiary of a solicitor's bill. And then finally, um, a, a discussion in quite general terms, but looking at how we are in relation to ADR, particularly in costs at present. Um, but I'd like to start with the, um, the Supreme Court case, PACAR, which is considering uh, litigation funding. And of course, we have to be very careful about what we say here because the, um, the court has heard arguments, reserved judgment, and we know that all of the Supreme Court judges are um, frequent viewers of Practico's uh, podcast. So um, anything we say may well influence them. Um, with that warning in mind, Andrew, I pass it over to you to give us an introduction on, on the case of Packard. Right, I'll try not to be not to uh, be too persuasive in either direction, given given what you rightly say, Jeremy, about the the, the deep influence that this that this podcast has on the shape of the law. Um, lots of the audience will be aware of the huge scale of litigation that's now going on in various claims in front of the Competition Appeal Tribunal. This particular case, PACAR against the Road Haulage Association arises out of a finding by the European Commission that all the truck manufacturers in Europe were, were running a cartel. Uh, so everyone who bought a truck between 1997 and 2011 paid too much. And all of those people are therefore entitled to compensation. And the, the way that compensation is brought is in the Compensation Appeal Tribunal under an opt-out procedure. So you don't need to opt in to the, to the litigation. You are by default included in the litigation if you are within the class of people who suffered the loss. It's, it's huge scale litigation. It runs into hundreds of millions or billions of pounds, depending on how you do the calculation of the losses. Uh, and it needs funding. And all these CAT cases have been funded uh, by litigation funders. Uh, in the uh, and the first stage is the making of a collective proceedings order. And in this case, the truck manufacturers have taken the point that it's funded uh, by the litigation funders. Those funding agreements, they have said, are unlawful DBAs because the amount of the sum that's going to be recovered by the litigation funder is governed by the extent of the damages recovered. Um, and the argument is that Section 58AA of the Courts and Legal Services Act renders all DBAs unlawful unless they comply with the DBA regs. That's obviously right. Um, Section 58AA doesn't merely apply to solicitors and barristers. It also applies to any person providing claims management services. Again, so far so uncontroversial. Uh, the, uh, the wrinkle is that the definition of claims management services is the definition in the Compensation Act 2006. And that definition includes a section uh, includes a section four, subsection three, 
um, and I'll just get the exact wording, for the purposes of this section, a reference to the provision of services includes in particular a reference to the provision of financial services or assistance. So claims management services includes the provision of financial services or assistance. So the argument runs, litigation funding is clearly the provision of financial services and or assistance. Therefore, it's within section 58AA. It doesn't comply with the DBA regs. Therefore, these DBAs are unenforceable. Um, point was taken in front of the Competition Appeal Tribunal and they rejected it. Point was taken on in front of the Divisional Court on appeal and they rejected it on, on review. Um, the Divisional Court held that ultimately it was a question of construction of the relevant statutory uh, provisions. And that while litigation funding might fall within a literal reading of section four that I've just the section I've just 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 run through, um, claims management services meant actually managing the claim, not merely funding the claim. And therefore, uh, that section should be interpreted as applying only to those who are managing claims and not to those who are funding claims. Um, big big sigh of relief from the claimants and big sigh of relief at that point from the litigation funding industry. Because if this point is good, it doesn't merely apply to claims in front of the Competition Appeal Tribunal. It applies generally to litigation funding because all litigation funding is based, or more or less all litigation funding, uh, is based on terms uh, in there being what's called a waterfall, whereby the litigation funder receives a share of the proceeds. And if that's a DBA, well, they don't, they're, they're, those agreements are most unlikely to comply with the DBA regs. So a real threat to a very large uh, sector. So, but of course it didn't stop with the divisional court. The truck manufacturers have appealed to the Supreme Court because of course they've appealed to the Supreme Court. The case is worth hundreds of millions of pounds and this is a chance of knocking it out at the early stage. Why wouldn't they? Um, the appeal was heard in February. Uh, judgment has been reserved and we do not know what they will decide. Um, but it is striking that whereas the claimant's representatives were treated broadly sympathetically by the Competition Appeal Tribunal and the Divisional Court, um, they um, were given a hard time in the Supreme Court. Um, the argument that the defendant's arguments could bring down the litigation funding sector and damage access to justice did not seem to get great traction with their lordships. And, and, um, and actually, although it was made a big thing of in the, in the written cases, it wasn't really the center of the of the oral argument in front of in, in, in front of the Supreme Court. At least two of the judges, uh, Lord Sales and Lord Leggett, seem to have been attracted by the plain meaning of the words and unpersuaded by the claimants. Um, and uh, P.J. Kirby, who was uh, leading for one of the the two. Uh, groups bringing the collective proceedings was given a fairly torrid time uh, when he was seeking to advance his arguments. Now, this is, of course, just the argument. We don't know what the judges will decide. Um, while Leggett and Sales were not sympathetic, Lady Rose was more sympathetic and then uh, harder to read what Lord Stevens and Lord Reed were thinking. Um, and of course, one has to say that one doesn't always know how judges are thinking. Uh, I've had the experience of being in the Court of Appeal, where I think that from their interjections, from their questions, from the, the debate, their minds are going in a particular direction, and one hopes one's addressed that. Um, sometimes when you get the judgment, it's completely different. And the, the, the central point turns out to be something that was only dealt with relatively briefly in oral argument. So sorry, phone, phone not on silent, Barrister's classic, classic mistake, apologies. You didn't um, hear it, Andrew, actually. 
You got there very quickly. Oh, that's because my that's because my lightning sharp reaction, you see. <laughs> that 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 you're that, that that you're fine. That's the that's the absolute and so subtle too. Yeah. I mean that's yeah. the thing. I, I, I should be on the stage doing magic, actually. The, you know, the quickness of the eye, to see, you know, the quickness of the hand deceives the eye. That's the great thing about this. Um, right. Um, so, yes, uh, one doesn't know uh, from oral argument always uh, what um, judicial um, appeal courts in particular are thinking. Um, they do go away and think about it, and they go away and, th and they sometimes come to very different conclusions uh to those that you think that they are um uh, they, they, they you act you know their mind is often working in different ways um must have been a bit off-putting oh, though for, for pj kirby when lord reed said to him well um, just uh, help me with this um suppose we find against you what can be absolutely. done about it <laughs> not a good moment not a good moment for pj I, I i i completely agree and i have to say i mean very you know very tough, very tough on an advocate when 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 that is said relatively early in your submissions. Yeah, it's not, it's not a yeah yeah no no it was it was not good. Um, if it does go that way, it's very serious in the obvious respect that it's pretty catastrophic for litigation funders because their agreements uh, do not work and uh, pretty catastrophic for people who are dependent on litigation funding because the litigation funding agreements don't work. There's also uh, an extra difficulty or, or an extra opportunity. See this either way. We live in a, in a world in which difficulties are, of course, opportunities too, ha-ha, um, which is if these agreements are unlawful, these agreements have always been unlawful. And therefore, all the people who have paid out, who have lost some of their damages to litigation funders under the working of the waterfall, may very well have claims to recover from the litigation funders or that share of the damages. Um, and that'll be an interesting bit of litigation. And I'm not well, sure. Isn't the remedy, uh, isn't the sanction that the agreements are unenforceable? So that will give rise to questions where, where an agreement has been completed. Am, am I right in thinking that's the language? I think it's unenforceable. Uh, yeah, that's right. The language is unenforceable, and so it will be the it will be the completion, and it will be the question of whether uh, those can be reopened effectively. Exactly, and then there'll be lots of questions about misrepresentation, and also it'll go on forever. It'll be um, dramatic. It'll, get, it'll be. It'll be a here. It'll be here, and of course, and that what the the question that Jeremy just just raised about well, what can they do is a really interesting one because normally, um, if it's an insurance company whose products are looking in difficulty, normally speaking, the insure the answer is well, lobby the relevant bits of the go relevant government departments and get the relevant government department. To change the rules so that it says what the insurance industry hoped it did say and thereby you can sort it all out and we've, we've seen that going on recently. I'm not convinced that the litigation funding industry is going to have such an easy ride by talking to government to make a you know change of change of regulation to sort it all out uh, because of course these huge claims can be brought against the government as much as they can be brought against anybody else. So they may not mind as much or as all that if the litigation funding industry takes a hit. Mm. Mm. Can, can I ask a question, Andrew, which is very indiscreet and you don't have to answer, but um, I assume that in respect of all the, the DBA or litigation funding agreements which are in force at the moment, the litigation funders are taking some sort of measures to put in alternative agreements in case the, the, the litigation funding agreements yeah. held to be DBAs. Is, is that something that all the cost council are busy drafting, um, albeit it's, the, it's, um, There's certainly activity in, the, in that general field. <laughs> I think that's probably, that's probably the discreet way to answer it. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> contingency, contingency steps are being taken now. Of course, it's 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 interesting and difficult to know exactly what those contingency steps may be. Yeah. You know, because although you can draft, you know, draft fallback agreements that, that you know are effective if if this is ineffective, um, it's quite difficult to formulate ones that are particularly satisfactory. Yeah, and comply with 
the DBA regs. Well, exactly. Well, uh, I, it, it's quite difficult to turn them into ones that comply with DBA regs, and it's yeah. quite difficult to think of other things that aren't that, as it were, that aren't DBA, that aren't contrary, to, or, or, or that, to, that would take it outside the DBA formulation. And if you want to share the uh, share of the spoils, then depending on what the Supreme Court should decide, it may be very difficult to draft anything uh, that doesn't doesn't make it an unenforceable DBA. Yeah. Anyway, we're not uh, asking for your free uh, advice to the litigation funding industry on yes. this call. No, 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 no. I mean, the, you know, the, the, the you know the free advice is is what they're already doing at the moment, which is run around run around in circles screaming. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, look at the sky and wonder when it falls on your head. Is the is the, is the free advice at the moment? Yeah, it must be. It must be. Well, um, my, no, my so question the, is um, really probably more aimed at Jeremy, which is that. Uh, um, I speculate that if this had all been happening 10 years ago, it might have been you standing there where PJ was the other day. I mean, um, you know, yeah. do you miss it or are you quite relieved that that wasn't you? <laughs> I was extremely relieved that was not me because I was thinking exactly that. Yeah, it's a good question, I was thinking. <laughs> um, but actually, what's quite interesting about this, um, that they made reference in the argument to um, an article by Rachel Mulheron in the Cambridge Law Journal in... I think 2014, um, to show that although the argument now was this, you know, this is going to cause the skies to fall in because we've all worked on the assumption that these agreements uh, are not DBAs, uh, they made the point that she actually raised the issue in an article in, in 2014, so that it's not a, a totally new issue. She she raised it to dismiss it because obviously she's a great supporter of um, of opt out uh, litigation generally, and of litigation funding as well with her Australian background. But um, quite an interesting point. I actually had the same thought when the draft regulations came out, which is a little bit before that. And um, I got in touch with the, um, I can't remember if the, the Association of Litigation Funding was actually enforced then, but there was a group of, of litigation funders, and I'd done some work for them, and said, look, I think you should be aware about this, because on the, on the natural reading, of these regulations, it could cover your business. And they, uh, I'm fairly sure they got in touch with Ministry of Justice at the time to say, look, you need to reword this because it is potentially going to cover us. And you know that's a problem because you're trying to back uh, litigation funding as, as policy was at the time. And the Ministry of Justice, of course, knew better and, and did nothing about it, which is exactly the same experience as I remember in the days when CFAs were either just coming in or being amended, I forget which, but a similar discussion went on with the Ministry of Justice officials in which they completely rejected expert advice from people who knew what they're talking about and took the view that they knew better. And the result in that particular case was the cost wars, which, um, well, certainly Andrew and I did very well out of, but I'm not sure that the world at large did. And I think the same same risk is, is, is here. Absolutely. Uh, yes, I think that, no, I think that's that, that's absolutely on point. Um, and because it's the plain, you know, the plain meaning of the of the regular of the of the section, um, there clearly is huge scope for 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 this to go wrong for the for the industry. Um, and as I say, I'm not sure that now government will row to the rescue i mean it may i think jeremy's made it pretty clear that it was the ministry of justice that's that's considerably um responsible for the mess that that they that the industry may now be in but i don't think that for a moment that's going to mean that they think it's going to be a priority to sort it out by amendments the, the other the other issue which is quite interesting is um the, the arguments which were run by those who are defending the litigation funding setup were that, well, if litigation funders are caught, then almost everybody else who's got anything to do with the claim is like the taxi driver who takes the person to court, the, the barrister's clerk, um, all sorts of things, because the, the language is very, very wide indeed. And particularly banks, probably banks were the most telling example, a bank who lends money to somebody for the purpose of litigation. Are they caught as well? Yeah. Are all these agreements unenforceable? I, I, I suspect that although, um, as, as Andrew has said, the majority, well, the majority, no, two of the members of the, of the Supreme Court seem to be quite 
taken with the natural meaning of the words argument, if they do reflect on the widespread consequences, they, they might come up with a different conclusion um, because it is, it is potentially very wide uh, and sweeping. Yeah, that's that was the best. That was definitely the best of the claimant's argument. The the unintended consequences of the of, of the of the breadth. I think there is a difference between a bank lending and these much more complex these much more complex funding agreements in which the in which the litigation funders do have a. a effectively an active part to play in shaping in shaping the litigation. One thing I must say, I didn't listen to the, to the whole of um, Bank and Tanky's argument, although he's very persuasive and very good, um, but it was just quite long. Um, I don't know if the um, if examples of the amount of money that litigation funders take um, were raised before the court, because that's the sort of prejudice point that anyone who's attacking litigation fundings would always want to raise to say how much money is being made out of out of litigation by um, third party funders in a way which 30 or 40 years ago would have been unlawful for Champerty. Um, I, I think he didn't in the oral argument, but of course it may well have been in the written case. It mm. would, I mean, he, he deliberately pitched his argument in a sort of quite high minded um, uh, admin court sort of sort of this is, you know, as a matter of matter of statutory construction, the consequences is this sort of way rather than um, throw, throwing buckets of prejudice here and there. Um, it may well be in the written case, um, but it but it was it didn't certainly didn't loom large in his oral argument. So that sort of yeah. that sort of angle would would seem to suggest that it should be more regulated rather than banned entirely. It seems to me. But, uh... Yeah, but that's always a difficulty for the Supreme Court because they don't have any they don't have any any, any meaningful power to no. you know to, to to do anything about regulation. But yes, I'm I'm very sympathetic because I've seen I've seen waterfall agreements that have eye watering um, amounts. You know that that when you do go through the analysis and think for whose benefit is this litigation really being brought, uh, by the time you've, you've added up all the bits that the lawyers and litigation funders are getting, um, the actual litigants' interests start to seem smaller and smaller once you've put it all, once you've, you've wrapped it all up. And that is something um, that I can see might um, give concern in terms of the extent of, in terms of the extent of regulation. But standing back for a moment, do we think this is the end of litigation funding or do we think they'll find a way around any problems that might arise? Um, I mean, standing back, I suspect, like Jeremy, I suspect that the Supreme Court will probably, or be possibly by a majority of three to two, stand back from the brink. If they don't stand back from the brink, if they do, in fact, um, say that these are all, all unlawful DBAs, um, it's probable that some other form of legally compliant litigation funding can be created or can be sort of hewn, hewn, from, the, hewn from the wreckage. Um, someone can, can put together something uh, that amounts to litigation funding. I think it's relatively unlikely that all litigation funding will just will just die overnight. The uh, I mean yes I mean I, I I wondered just purely speculating listening to some of those judicial comments whether it was really although poor old PJ was getting it you know but getting both barrels it was really more of directed at the government along the lines of you know another fine mess you've got us into you know we'll have to get you out of it again sort of stuff. It, it may may there may be something of that in there I don't know. It, this all course may yeah, be no, one of think... those. Is it? Was it? Well, it's right. I've had many problems in my life. Most of them didn't happen. You know, we we may <laughs> we may be re reflecting about a near miss in a in a month or two's time. Who knows? Of, of course yeah. we may. Of course we may. I mean, that's that's perfectly possible. But uh, but it but it is a it is a um, even if it is a near miss, it's quite an important. You know, it's it, it's pretty important for people to to, to near be death conscious of really not a near, not a near miss would it be. And also, while the litigation funders are running around trying to do something about it, um, haven't seen 
just, you know, purely, purely anecdotally, enormous numbers of the clients running around trying to do something about it so far and and they too need to be need to be um thinking about what on earth what on earth they're going to do because it, it's not only a question of litigation funding but it would also be the death knell for collective proceedings wouldn't it in, um, in, in the way that they are seen at present certainly opt opt out absolutely yeah i i think it probably i think it would probably have to be yes and they're only just um, up to full, to full steam as well, aren't they? You know, Merrick's is motoring on, oh, yeah. but it's taken years to get yeah. there. Well, there's so much uncertainty because uh, there was so much uncertainty whether they were, you know, the, Ber the Merrick's case took such a long time because of the uncertainty about whether the whole thing was viable or not. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, um, with that um, discussion, I think, I think it's a really interesting area and um, looking forward to to reading the judgments. Um, if we can go from the sublime to the cost office. Um, something about oh. uh, alley, alley rate decisions in, in phone hacking cases. What's that? Right, and since Jer Jeremy mentions this is phone hacking, this is great for him and me because the third member of our panel, um, we understand, was in fact acting uh, for the defendants in this case. The case oh, is very... As of, as of 10 o'clock. <laughs> oh, what, what is that? Is that Rupert Murdoch on the other line? No. Is that the point, Andy? You've got a spontaneously planned plan reporting. I, I a sp spontaneous plan reporting to Rupert Murdoch as to how the litigation's going. What are you trying to do to me? <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave this one to okay, you, Andy, so, yeah? I'll leave this one to you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Master, uh, Master Rayleigh, um, it's a detailed assessment. It's another tranche of the phone hacking cases. It's various claimants against the news group. Uh, 2023 EWHC H27SCCO. Um, references will, don't frantically rush for the pen. References will, will follow, as Jeremy said. Um, various preliminary points decided at enormous length, but the point of, of general importance is hourly rates and what, what the master had to say about the status of the guideline hourly rates. Um, really, I think three points. Proportionality, he says, doesn't just apply generally, it applies specifically to the hourly rates. Secondly, while guideline rates are a starting point, they are only a starting point. And this is really because there, aren't, there are, isn't any other starting point. He's not really any, uh, there's no real enthusiasm for the guideline hourly rates as being a sensible basis for deciding hourly rates more generally. Um, but no one does expensive time calculations anymore. There are no other sensible surveys. So where is a cost judge to start other than with guideline hourly rates? Um, but it's only a starting point. And given it's only a starting point, the third thing to draw from this is that this master is quite willing to allow costs significantly in excess of guideline rates. Um, and I think that's pretty that's pretty general on detail assessment. Um, that, 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 that although um, paying parties will, will, will trot them out and saying couple shouldn't possibly shouldn't possibly go higher, actually um, receiving parties are pushing at a relatively open door uh, in if they can show elements of show aspects of the case that, that justify higher rates, relatively easy to do so. Um, Jeremy, what are your thoughts on that? There's no good my asking Andy because he's biased here. <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> I suppose it leaves then guideline early rates as basically to, to assist uh, non-specialist judges in, uh, in summary assessments. Um, but I thought there were some at least um, noises from the uh, the next level up in, in the court system that uh, actually the guideline hourly rates were not to be just automatically um, increased. The, 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 you had really had to show good reason why um, cases were particularly heavy to, to go beyond them. So is there a bit of a tension there? I, I think I think there is a bit of a tension there, but, but I think that guidance from um, uh, 
uh, from the judges in the Court of Appeal is very much, I think, directed at judge and non-specialist judges doing doing summary assessments. I don't yeah. think it's particularly directed at the detailed assessment process, which isn't perceived as being a you know particularly. Um, it isn't perceived as I, I suspect it isn't perceived by the senior judiciary as a particular problem with that. I think what's perceived as the pro with problem is with is with summary assessment um, being going back to being whatever number the, the the trial judge wants. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, it's not a major not decision, but uh, it, it's a a footnote if you like to the arguments about uh, early rates, and and those are always welcome. Um, yeah, we wanted to to. Give people a quick reminder about um, the extension of the fixed costs regime. Yes, um, two reasons it's worth talking about. Um, first of all, it's April, so it's changes to CPR season. Um, and therefore, what we've now got, as well as knowing this is coming, is we've now got uh, the draft rules. Um, so, first of all, on the general point, um, extension to £100,000 is on its way, uh, and there is a trap in the way that the new regime is being introduced. Um, as it applies to personal injury and clinical negligence claims, it only applies if the accident or other cause of action takes place after the 30th of September of 2023. So there is a great long phasing period for personal injury and clinical negligence lawyers, and they needn't worry about it. All other claims, whenever the cause of action accrued, issued after the 30th of September, will be caught by the new regime. There is therefore an obvious elephant trap for people that do a lot of PI and do a little bit of cases that are that are not PI cases, because they're going to find themselves um, uh, caught to their surprise by the new regime. Um, there will be, therefore, a deluge of cases issued by, well, in the next few months, and in particular in September, and in particular, as we know, in the last five days in September, because that's the way this always happens. Um, Therefore, uh, your client, Sandy, will be well advised to get on with it and do this now. Um, but of course, there's a bit of a Milton's fork here. On the one hand, if you've ever been instructed, if you've been instructed by a client and um, you think you might actually have to issue proceedings, well, get on and issue proceedings. But on the other hand, get on and prematurely issue proceedings before you really know exactly where you stand, and you potentially face liability for the adverse costs consequences of having got on and issued proceedings. Now, you may be able to get around that by putting stays in place or agree, agreeing uh, that no one will do anything in the litigation, uh, but absent that, plenty of your clients, Andy, are going to be facing potential claims, as it were, that don't only run, way, run one way. The obvious way they run is, is that inaction is, you know, inaction is hazardous. Uh, but actually, action may be hazardous too, unless, unless, they, unless, they, unless they do the right things. Yes, indeed. Um, so that's the general point. Uh, the more uh, detailed point is that the rules are out and the rules are ridiculously complex. Um, the amended versions of part 45, part 26 and part 36 run gloriously to 144 pages. Uh, part 45 has been entirely rewritten. Part 26 has been entirely rewritten. There is, you'll all be delighted to hear, a new intermediate track between the fast track and the multi-track. And that's not where the pleasure and excitement for procedure nerds ends, uh, because each of the tracks um, has complexity bands. There are four complexity bands on the first track, and there are four complexity bands on the intermediate track. Um, there are different matrices of costs for each band. Some of those matrices are added together. Some include other elements. I mean, it's a, a as I say, it's a, it's a, it's a sort of 
procedural procedural rule lovers train spotters charter it really is i mean this is a <laughs> ludicrously complex set of rules um the significance for your clients is that there is now a whole marvelous industry to be to develop about allocation to track and allocation within track because allocation to track is going to make an enormous difference but so is allocation to complexity bands within tracks. And it's not straightforwardly, because it's about complexity bands, it's not straightforwardly about our amounts of money. There's a whole load of other stuff that's capable of being argued about. Um, and we therefore, um, talking of, talking of uh, as we were earlier, of cost wars and, the, and so forth, this is another area, sort of slightly like, I suppose, like the, like the first days of cost budgeting, in which every in, in which what in effect will happen is that the focus of the argument moves from the end of the case to the early stage of the case, um, and until the landscape is clear, all the money that is notionally being saved on detailed assessments is merely transferred to arguments about allocation. Exactly. exactly. So, so to that extent, do you think it? It seems to be, it seems to run counter to the mood music around why are we still doing budgeting. I appreciate they won't be doing budgeting if costs are, if, if costs are going to be fixed. I understand that, but they want to take out apart from they, they want to take out too much case management resource, and now they've introduced a load of other case management resources. Completely, completely. Now that budgeting is sort of settled down to the point of being broadly manageable, I mean, not you know, not entirely, but sort of in very broad yeah. terms, it's sort of working working a lot better than it was. Um, not, you know, not everyone's happy with the outcomes, but it's be better than it was. And now every district judge and, and and master in the country is going to be faced with a deluge of litigation about this law, yeah. and particularly the district judges, of course. Um, uh, because this is typically going to be in a, a cad court litigation, but it isn't all. There's plenty of you know, there's plenty of high court litigation at under, under £100,000, there's so plenty of that. Um, and they're all going to be facing enormous amounts of argument um, about allocation, and inevitably, because they're going to get so much of it, they're going to have to have sort of policy approaches, and those are going to be challenged. Yes, exactly, exactly. It won't surprise Do you remember me the, that um, I'm not a fan of fixed costs. That may, that may settle down. You might be shocked by that statement, but um... <laughs> I, 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 yeah, Andy. I mean, it's awful. I mean, how, who, who, who knew? Who knew that you would you would think that a that a that a strange system that caused you to have to get to try and advise clients as to as to baffling things, and then and then it abolished both cost budgeting and, and detail assessments. Uh, who knew that that would in some way. Uh, yeah. Be antipathetic to to you exactly, exactly. I, I somehow I don't think I just don't think they think about the poor cost draftsman. <laughs> yeah, I know, and obviously, I mean, what I mean, fortunately, we we've got a new Lord Chancellor, uh, who um, Alex Chalk, who was actually my pupil, which makes me feel astonishingly <laughs> old. Oh. Uh, um, and um, obviously, obviously, because. In his pupilage, he saw a little bit of cost litigation. I'm absolutely confident that as he walked in the office, he said, "What do I want to change about? Uh, what do I want to change about the Ministry of Justice? I think there's not been enough focus on cost lawyers." That I'm sure that will have been his, you know, first two or three sentences when he walked into the private office. Exactly, uh, I'm, I'm sure that's the case. Well, make the most of it because we're on on average six months. Is that the average tenure of a <laughs> Ministry of Justice? <laughs> Pretty well, pretty well. But the thing is, the thing is, I mean, don't forget, don't forget that one of them was Liz Truss. So, I mean, really, that you know, it, it, is, um, it, it is not an office of state that perhaps has the gravitas it once had. No, perhaps not. Perhaps not. But we all know now that if you've got a bit of an issue, like, for example, uh, when the Supreme Court makes a decision which may not favour it, all you have to do is have a word with Andrew and he'll have a word with his former pupil and it'll get sorted. Uh, of course, of course. I mean, I think one probably, I mean, uh, having a word would be understating it. I mean, I think one would probably have to send a set of instructions. Um, <laughs> rather than... Sorry, that is a joke, and I, that is absolutely untrue, all of that. 
Yeah. It slightly reminds me of a case I was, I was instructed in a case um, in the 90s um, when Blair had recently become prime minister and uh, it was a trade union instruction and we had to have Cherie Booth as the leader um, in the hope that um, she would have a word with Tony um, you know, over the pillow at night and it would all get sorted. And in fact, it was a time when um, anything to do with trade unions was anathema to, to Blair because he was trying to show that they were new Labour and they weren't dependent on unions in the old way. Um, and uh, in fact, you know, Politically, it was a, it was a hopeless um, thing to do, uh, and Cherie was stuck with arguing this very esoteric stuff. She wasn't very familiar with, but she did it very well, and and it all worked out okay in the end. But it, some of this sort of political thinking can backfire occasionally. Yeah, anyway, um, yeah, no. that I mean, interesting stuff, and particularly about the dilemma that um, solicitors are going to face in relation to fixed costs if they've got um, instructions coming in now, which. Um, could lead to, to the issue of proceedings um, in time. Um, another uh, decision of the cost office we want to have a quick look at is Kenig and Thompson, Snell and Parsmore, which is the latest in a string of decisions which seem to have come to the light more recently about the possibility for beneficiaries to challenge solicitors' bills. And in this case, it's the beneficiary under an estate. Um, what, what do we need to know about that, Andrew? Uh, well, this is a case which my colleague, Alicia Chu, who I think spoke to you both um, yeah. a couple of months ago, uh, she, she, she acted on behalf of the solicitors in it. It's a decision of cost judge Simon Brown. It claimed by a beneficiary um, about bills for administering a state, an estate estimate 10 to 15,000 pounds to administer, administer the estate, actual costs 54,000 pounds. Beneficiaries, unsurprisingly, not best pleased. Um, solicitors resisted on various bases, but the particularly important one is, 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 a, this is that they relied on a decision a couple of years ago called Tim Martin. Um, which is about third parties challenging costs and we're in which uh, there was a significant limitation by the Court of Appeal on the ability uh, to which a person liable to pay a bill other than a client can in fact meaningfully challenge the bill uh, because of restrictions effectively to points that that client themselves would have been able to raise. And solicitors argued in the, in the Kenny case they argued that the Tim Martin decision meant that any assessment that was ordered would be of limited use and therefore should not be ordered because there would be so very little that was actually open to challenge uh, because of the Tim Martin principle. Um, and that did not find favour with, with Mark Brown. Um, he held that there could be a meaningful assessment uh, and ordered assessment of all the bills. Um, it's clear from his approach in the judgment that there's a perception, certainly from him, and perhaps more broadly, that the Tim Martin decision shuts out non-clients who in fact end up paying bills. Um, and it may not be surprising that where there is prima facie evidence of overcharging, the, the courts are not keen to apply it. Um, but the solicitors strongly think it's wrong um, and they are appealing the decision. Uh, Master Brown gave permission to appeal and uh, allowed a leapfrog to the Court of Appeal. And so Alicia is being led by Mark Freston on an appeal to the Court of Appeal. The concern that the solicitors have is that opening up is that this decision opens up probate work to challenges from beneficiaries and they think this will be the next check my fees sort of um, uh, uh, sort of parasitic litigation area that a whole load of claims, speculative claims will be brought that will be expensive for solicitors to defend 
and that that those sorts of firms will move on from the PI work to to probate work and bring challenges. Um, my personal take is that the courts will not be very comfortable with the Tim Martin decision being used as a way to shut the door on traditional mm. bills. Um, so I'm not, I think it's going to be a bit of an uphill struggle uh, for uh, Mark and Alicia in the Court of Appeal. Um, and I wouldn't be amazed if they were found ways to limit the Tim Martin, the effects of the Tim Martin decision, although on its face, it does make it difficult for non-clients to challenge what the client has actually been charged, notwithstanding that they're the ones who have to pay it. Um, actually, there'll be a discomfort there'll be a discomfort about that um where you know the, the, you know, the it's not any it's not a small p politically easy position to say that you've got evidence that the fees are a great deal higher than expected but the person actually paying the the only person who can challenge this is the person who isn't paying and the person who is paying isn't entitled to challenge it that's not what the Solicitors Act is intended to achieve, I think they, the Court of Appeal will feel. Uh, and I think there will be a great deal of, of resistance to that. Um, that said, um, that said, they, you know, they do, the Court of Appeal as a matter of principle does, does, does stick with its previous decisions and Tim Martin is their previous decision. So there's a, there's a sort of, there's a tension there in, in how they're going to approach it. So I think it's another one in which uh, this is a bit of a watch this space and find out what may or may not occur. It's interesting how these um, these issues have have sort of raised their ugly heads again because for a long time there was no litigation at all about this. And one of the interesting things about reading the judgment was citations from Victorian judgments, and, and it was clear from that that the Victorian judges knew their costs law and their solicitors' uh, costs law in particular extremely well. Um, and and we, we find all those issues um, coming to the fore again, and, and solicitors, I'm sure, will not be very happy about that but equally uh, there, there is an injustice in this particular case for reasons which were not clear the the actual executor who was the uncle i think of the beneficiaries um had decided to take no part in 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 the proceedings in fact hadn't probably hadn't even been told about them and it was one mm -hmm. of the uh, the issues um and so it's a bit tough if through the, the silence of the person who's nominally liable uh, as the solicitor's client the beneficiaries are actually bearing the costs should have no um, no recourse at all to what, um, yep. on the face of it, were charges that required explanation, to put it no higher than that. Mm. Mm. Yeah, you beat me too. No, no, like, I, 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 like, sorry, Andy. Not at all. I was just saying that but Jeremy beat me too. That was exactly the point I was going to make in terms of that's what struck me. That it, was, it was strange that there was no involvement from the executor at all. Yeah, no, and, I, and, and, and as, as Jeremy said, so it's not apparent from the judgment why why that was the case. It, uh, it, is, it is an odd feature. I mean, I'm very interested in the, the more general point that Jeremy makes, which is that this was all much argued about in the late 19th century. Um, it, one analysis would, of course, be uh, that what's happened in the last 40 years is that the extent to which inherited wealth is tremendously important to to the to, to, the, to the, the the rising generations, which was very much the case in Victorian times, is back to being very important, and therefore arguing about probate is now suddenly coming back into fashion, or something is gradually coming back into fashion. Uh, that just as for the Victorians. Every happy endings only happen because of a will um, in Victorian novels. The same sort of thing, same sort of thing is happening now. Uh, the young, the young can only purchase and only get a deposit on a property if they, if if the, if the um, inheritance uh, comes through, um, and therefore um, being fleeced out of a significant part of that inheritance by a solicitor, as they may see it, um, is something well worth litigating about. That's wonderful, <laughs> wonderfully broad view. I must say, actually, really fun thought. Um, to otherwise, rather mundane case. Um, we should move on um, to the final topic. We're going to have a, 
a bit of a talk about, which was um, the role of ADR, particularly in, in costs. What, what are your thoughts on that? And, and both of you will obviously have um, interesting and possibly different thoughts on, on this. I don't know. Yes. Um, I, I have a lot of experience of, of various sorts of ADR, both in costs and more generally in my, my in my other life of doing clinical negligence work in which ADR is very is very prominent and the and uh, the the courts are very keen to encourage it my general personal view is that the most effective form of ADR where both sides are, are represented by competent teams of lawyers is for the two teams of lawyers to sit down together and negotiate directly um, there's a lot, the, the sort of default form of, of ADR in terms of judicial guidance is mediation. But I have never really found, and I, other people don't agree, but I've never found that mediators add very much. I, I, and I, and there have been absurd times um, when I, my, I, my opponent would just have to ask the mediator to go and sit in a room so that he and I can <laughs> negotiate directly with each other <laughs> because the messages he was passing between us were getting more and more garbled and we're thinking that can't seriously be what um, opposite number actually said and so we eventually just sort of met each other in the corridor and said look can we just negotiate directly so we parked the parked the mediator um, so um, I'm not you know I'm not a fan of that i can see and what people say about this is where the other side have a fundamental misunderstanding or there's a fundamental disagreement or there's some sort of egos in play such that it's really helpful to get a mediator in there to bring it through but my general feeling is that it ought to be possible if you've got teams of lawyers who both know what they're doing and both take a realistic view of the prospects and the, the prospect success and the, and the value. Well, you ought to be able to bash away to, to, to getting to a sensible solution if there's a sensible solution to be found. Of course, sometimes there isn't. Sometimes there is no alternative. ADR will fail because your respective views and your clients' respective views are far apart. And that applies as much in cost as it does in any other field. Um, I think the other, the other mode of ADR that's a bit fashionable at the moment is expert determination. Um, and I think that can have a role where there is a there where there are properly defined issues that make a real difference. If you can say to an independent barrister or solicitor or law of some sort, um, here's the central issue in the case, or here is a central issue in the case, and we would like you to determine this as an expert, not as an arbitrator, not as a mediator, but a straightforward expert, and determine the issue, that can be very useful. And that can save an enormous amount of cost, cut through. You've got you've got you've got a binding agreement between between the parties and but that's been determined. And of course choosing the expert is potentially the thing you end up arguing about. But assuming you can, I think that's very useful. Um, my other thought about ADR and this is something I've been thinking about a lot in the last six months, as it has become apparent that even though the pandemic is over, the way we're talking to each other via Zoom or via Teams is now the default position. And what I wanted to, to talk about and think about, I'd be interested to hear what both of you think about this, is my personal feeling is that ADR works much less well remotely than in person. Um, I think there are two big reasons for that. The first is that there is a real investment in coming to a deal if people come together, if people make a journey, go to an, go to an office, one or, one or the other's office, and set aside a day. And talk about it. There's a there's a commitment to doing the deal, and there's a momentum that they're all present. Now, again, of course, we've all done it and it's failed, but generally speaking, there is a benefit from that. The other thing is where things go wrong, and things, of course, very easily go wrong in mediation or arbitration or 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 or, 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 or a meeting or whatever it might be. It's very easy for things to go wrong. If things go wrong and the communication has failed and you're in person, 
then what I find usually works is I go and knock on the door, the other side's door, and say, can I have a quick word with the other person? Go out into the corridor, try and explain why you think it's gone wrong, and try and get things back on track. Re-establish trust between you. And I've never known the barrister, when I go and knock on the door and say, can I have a quick word? I never known them to say no. Whereas, remote speaking, you know, remote remote meeting, you go into the plenary session, the barrister's there, the solicitor's there, the client's there. I say, can we talk about this privately, just the lawyers with each other, at which point the client says no. Um, and, or indeed the barrister says no. But, but generally speaking, it's very hard. In theory, there could be a virtual chat in the corridor. In practice, unless you know your opponent well already, it's very hard to get to that direct communication away from the sort of cauldron pressures of everybody looking on and feeling tense. I mean, because by definition, this is a litigate, this is a negotiation which is going badly. And so you're in the plenary session, all these screens are uh, all these windows are up on the screen, everyone's glaring, everyone's feeling fed up. And then I try and say, oh, let's just, just have a chat. And everyone says, no, you can't do nothing. But of course, the immediate reaction in those circumstances is, is they're trying to they're trying to pull a fast one on us. And, and I hope I'm not. I hope in those circumstances I'm just trying to get the negotiations back on track. But I but my experience is that it is that that's a real difficulty. And I again, of course it's anecdotal, but my experience is that when I'm negotiating remotely it's more likely to go wrong and less likely to be to, to, to be resolved. Uh, and of course, annoyingly, what that often means is that cases get resolved in the three weeks after uh, the mediation or RTM, um, rather than actually being done on the day. Uh, what's, what's your take, what, uh, what you Andy? Um, I, I, mean, I, I think all of those aspects are really, uh, are really valid. Um, my okay. What do I not like about ADR? Well, uh, let's say let's let's control mediation for a while. I've, I've got to say I've probably been involved with a lot more direct negotiations that end up getting very bad tempered than I have mediations. Right. So so oh, interesting. But, but but sometimes you know burst in the you know the lance in the ball or what have you. Nevertheless, you know helps you to get there. But um, but. I, I would say that, whereas I think the 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 fact that a good mediator um, can be a calming influence, um, and it's not just that you don't have so much time directly talking to the, the, the opponents, um, a good mediator can work really well. So it's very hard for me to generalise about whether I'm pro or anti a particular approach. You know, we've had successful mediations with very skilled mediators, and um, the, 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 the bit I'm always a bit scared of now, particularly now, is the with the move towards and the sort of direction of travel towards potentially compulsory ADR or what have you. you know, it's yet another layer of costs. And the, 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 there's a sort of a weaponization sometimes of, of ADR. You know, if you don't do this, this is going to count against you. We must do this. And then it's quite obvious. It can be quite obvious that... Um, if you think your client might have undercooked the level of cost protection, that you know, it's just another, it's just another layer of cost, and you can't recycle and reuse all of the same material that you've used in mediation because it's covered by mediation privilege. Or, uh, you know, th there's some things you can borrow, but you know, sort of a, a note of introduction for a mediator is not quite the same as, as as you know the opening of an assessment. There are differences. Um, so, I. I still tend to favour it for big numbers because the, the the unwieldy nature of detailed assessments when you're talking about very large bills of costs um, is 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 a you know is is, is, a, is a real concern. Um, the um, I think that I've noticed this, there's nothing scientific about this, but I think I've noticed something that Andrew's picked up on, which is that. Um, I think some clients are far more concerned to put the straight jacket on their advisors and conditions upon them talking to each other 
you know, I don't know whether it's a trust thing or or, or a control thing or, or you know, whether there's legitimate concerns about that. I'm sure there's all of those things. Um, but, um, you know, I think I think maybe some clients would could be could be sceptical about, you know, Barristers Union, Costa Arsenal's Union, carve up, so on and so forth, you know, and, and just because of the dynamics of that, not because there's any evidence that that sort of thing would actually take place. Um so it's actually it shows both the, the good and the bad. I'm mean, thinking of the bar in particular. Yeah. I mean, Andrew's point is you it's not that often you suggest to a, an opponent you have a chat and they just tell you um to go away. Um mm -hmm. because there's generally quite a good relationship between people in the profession. Yeah. Um but equally that does give rise to the fear on the behalf of the, the client they're being sold by down the river because these two get on and they were in chambers together ten years ago or whatever it is, you know. Um yeah. It's been, it's interesting. On the inside, you think, "Oh, this is great," but actually, looking from the outside, maybe you can see the problems. And and, and likewise, I mean, I, I I completely relate to what Andrew said about remote mediations, and I've, I've been involved in both. I mean, you have to have one or the other. You can't have a hybrid. It seems to me. I mean, obviously, you can have the ultimate client who's making decisions, and you're getting instructions from. They can be elsewhere, and they're just right. You know, it's probably right that they are, and they're normally too busy to be there anyway um but uh in, in terms of the um again it's two competing ends of uh, ends of it really should resolution be driven by fatigue no or <laughs> really which is you know which is what can happen you know in the early hours of a mediation or you know of a one-day mediation or even the early hours of the second or third day of a, of a mediation you know then, then you you've literally battered yourself into submission really but is that necessarily the right result I, I don't know. I, it, at times it is, at times it isn't. It's sometimes very helpful to have experienced clients who are not with you. They're not sharing the same fatigue level, but they're checking in from time to time. They're not overly influenced by the fact that, well, I, I bet our, our advisors have been doing this for 16 hours non-stop now. I'm, sh I'm sure they're asking me to settle this for reasons other than the fact that this is the best deal I'm going to get. Um, but you know, if you mix it all together, um, the uh, I I like I still like the idea because of cost disputes that there's somebody there who can act as a filter for privileged information in perhaps a more dynamic way and helpful way than a, than, than happens formally in a in, in a cost assessment, and therefore you find ways of being enlightened and being able to have proper reasons to talk to your client and give them decent advice about whether they should move up or you know or move down depending upon which side of the uh, of the fence that you're on um so indeed so so mediation the skills of mediators i really admire when i see them in action what about um does your kind of mixed approach to it suggest that you wouldn't be in favor of um compulsory media compulsory adr yeah. What's that? What does that mean? Yeah. You must agree mm. something. Mm. You know, it, well, I know it's not that, but it's a, you know, it's a bit like they. Uh, I remember once somebody, uh, a strange cost judge or cost officer, sort of you know, barking at people and ordering them out of the room to go and agree something. Uh, yes. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> okay. um, exactly. Yeah. Um, but uh, it, yeah, I. Compulsory ADR seems to me to be, um, it's driven from the wrong motive, which is, you know, just to save public money and court costs and the cost of the administration of justice, you know, um, as opposed to um, recognising that it, it always should be on the palette, you know, it, 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 the, but the incentive should be it's the best, is, is a good way to resolve disputes, not because the rules say you've got to go through the motions of doing it. People but it's also involved. it's an extra it's an extra cost, isn't it? If if it's if it's hopeless, it's an extra cost. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. What what I've been, I had no experience of because we don't these days seem to do any family work at all is the experience of family practitioners where there's compulsory mediation in yeah. in, in, in family law and whether it, you know it would be academically interesting to talk to people who specialise in that and to say whether they think that's been a good thing or not. Yeah. Well, I've got a proposal for compulsory mediation for allocation to a difficulty level in the new intermediate track. 
How about that? <laughs> but, I think, I think you'd, but I think you'd have to budget for it. That's a great idea. <laughs> that would I, think, I, think, I think you'd have to have a budget for it as well. Yeah. Anyway, on that ridiculous note, um, thank you very much, both of you, for what's been a really interesting discussion. I hope those who are watching um, share that view and um, we'll be tuning in for the next uh, cost chat between friends. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, Andy.